training in good time. I was here early and observed that most of you joined uh, even 30 minutes before the hour. That is really encouraging. Thank you so much. So we would like to begin our, our discussion today. But uh, before we do that, I also want to welcome and really thank uh, Professor Walter for taking his time to really uh, make this presentation to us. Uh, just because uh, we are doing various activities within our respective countries that are related to, the agri to agroecology and climate change. And we really need a lot of experiences and to share a lot, keep sharing a lot. So thank you so much, uh, Professor, for joining us. And thank you also for keeping time. We'll ensure that uh, we also give each one of, of you some time to ask questions. If you do not get an opportunity to speak, kindly feel free to use the chat so we can be able to look at the questions and see how we can be able to respond to them. So you're most welcome. And uh, without uh, much ado, without wasting much, a lot of time, I would want to welcome our, our coordinator from the Secretariat, Bridget Mugambe, just to give an introductory remark, then we'll go back to the agenda. It's not long, we have uh, like an hour, so we'll be able to manage the time. Thank you so much. Welcome, Bridget. Um, thank you so much, uh, Karen, and uh, good day to everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, uh, like I've been introduced, my name is Bridget Mugambe, and um, I work with the AFSA uh, Secretariat as a programs coordinator, but I also facilitate uh, the climate change and agroecology working group uh, for AFSA. Uh, for those who may not know AFSA, briefly to introduce AFSA, AFSA is um, the biggest civil society movement in Africa uh, with a membership of uh, 35 networks and organizations working in up to 50 of the 54 African countries. AFSA has uh, four working groups and um, one of those working groups is the Agroecology and Climate Change uh, Working Group, which has organized this uh, webinar today. Uh, the other working groups are um, the Land and Agroecology Working Group, uh, Citizens uh, for Sustainable Food Systems Working Group, and, um, and uh, Resilience Systems. Um, the Climate Change Working Group is uh, running a campaign currently in 12 African countries on agroecology for climate action. And the goal of this campaign um, specifically is to integrate agroecology into climate policy within the regional uh, climate policies, but also national climate policies. And one of um, the challenges I think that has faced, uh, like Karen has also hinted, as we implement these many activities, is that uh, the policymakers, one of the issues they have raised is that they do not see us uh, really put across, you know, our agenda, our argument for agroecology clearly. And I think one of, of the reasons is that we ourselves have not really appreciated agroecology in the context of climate change. So the purpose of this webinar is one, to help us um, understand the subject of agroecology in the context of climate change uh, in a much deeper way uh, from what uh, Professor Walter is going to share with us and also have discussions among ourselves. Uh, that is why in this particular webinar, it's not really um, an advocacy meeting, but more of um, for purposes of us uh, really deepening our understanding on what agroecology is, how we can use it in our work in uh, advocating for um, climate adaptation and mitigation through agroecology. I would like to thank uh, Professor Walter uh, for taking the time uh, to prepare this presentation and to interact with us. We are looking forward to your presentation and also to thank uh, John Wilson uh, for facilitating this linkage and ensuring that this meeting happens. I welcome you all to listen in and interact after the presentation. Thank you, Karen, and uh, please over to you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Uh, for those who have just joined us, we are introducing ourselves through the chat, kindly do so. Your name, your organization, probably where you're Zooming from, and uh, we welcome you once more. So, uh, uh, Professor Walter, I uh, will come back to you now. I would well, first of all request you kindly to talk about yourself, then you can uh, jump over to the presentation. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And yes, good evening and good morning, respectively, wherever we are. Thank you, Bridget. And yeah, look, it's a wonderful opportunity. I've had a lot of 
information and long-term 50 years of information and contact with Africa, but actually I've never been there physically. So this is actually quite, uh, well, not quite physical, but certainly it's lovely to be on board. Just in terms of my background, look, I'm a, a soil microbial ecologist, I worked for a long time in research in CSIRO, which is Australia's premier research organization in forestry, tropical crops and pastures, and of course in soils. And so I had a fairly long research career, but then I basically moved more into looking at what do we do with our research? How do we apply it? How do we commercialize it? How do we actually make the changes on the ground with farmers for that change? I retired about 15 years ago and we formed a little organization, an NGO called Healthy Soils Australia to move that whole climate carbon advocacy agenda. Was involved with COP21 in Paris, but then basically since then have gone a bit further looking at uh, the actual bigger picture of hydrology in our climate. You know, what is the actual basically basis of agency? How do we actually influence our climate? How do we regenerate biosystems to ensure that we have a safe, secure climate, but not just a climate, obviously the water security, food security, biosystems that we depend on. And so this is operating through a little NGO again called Regenerate Earth, which we formed about five years ago. And it's gone much more global and is looking at these bigger issues of, yes, hydrology, climate, land regeneration, and really that whole sustainable future for humanity. And the context that we want to talk about tonight is actually, yes, how do we deepen our understanding of climate change and see where agroecology and practical grassroots regeneration strategies can fit in? Because we've known about climate change for the last 50 years. It was 50 years ago that Charles Keeling clearly showed us that, yes, here is the data. CO2 is going up abnormally. And of course, it is a greenhouse gas. It drives about 4% of the greenhouse gas effect. And so obviously, as CO2 goes up, so is the risk of global warming. And for 50 years, in a sense, we've made a fundamental mistake, in my understanding, because we've seen this as a cause, okay? We've, CO2 is going up. Yes, it's a greenhouse gas. And we focused on this is the cause of climate change. But I think we've got to be much more critical and open-minded and look at, is this perhaps, yes, a cause in a minor sense, but is it actually a symptom? You know, is that rising CO2 actually a symptom of something much, much more serious? And that's, in a sense, a systemic oxidation of carbon from our soils and our biosystems over the last thousands of years, but particularly the last 300 years. And with that, the degradation of our biosystems. And not just the degradation of the biosystems, but actually the capacity of those soils and biosystems to infiltrate, retain, and make available rainfall and water supplies. And so the crisis isn't just CO2, it's actually much more seriously water, you know, hydrology. And what have we done to the earth's or the land's hydrological cycles? We've always assumed that, look, we humans are not able to influence something so fundamental, but basically we have to challenge that question as well, because if we have, it has massive, serious consequences. And of course, 20 years ago, we got the warning that it's not just CO2 that's a problem, it's not just global warming progressively increasing by 2100 as the IPCC has focused on, but in fact, it's these dangerous hydrological climate extremes that are intensifying and, of course, impacting even now. And we see that all around the planet, you know, whether it's hurricanes, whether it's storms, floods, aridification, droughts, and wildfires. 
And these are intensifying, accelerating dangerously now and impacting biosystems everywhere. And of course, we know that in that context of hydrology, they absolutely threaten our water security. And of course, with that, the capacity to provide food, to grow enough food for humanity, there will be 9 billion of us on this planet by 2030 in eight years time. And so the question is, where do we actually find the water, the soils, the biosystems to sustain food production? Obviously the whole threat of species extinction, biosystem collapse is also very much driven by these hydrological threats. But what we want to talk about today is particularly the issue of climate, because while we've always seen the climate as something there, and we've looked at the CO2 component of it, in fact, 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet is driven by water. 4% is roughly what the CO2 component of the greenhouse gas effect contributes. So 95% of the world's climate is driven hydrologically. And if we've changed the hydrology of our soils, our landscapes, through our oxidation of our degradation of our soils, then we've really got to ask the serious question, has this impacted basically our climate? What are its long-term effects? And what can we do to manage that? And this is really fundamental because if it is hydrology that is influencing the climate, you know, what are the dangerous feedbacks, as we've already said, the floods, the aridification, the droughts, the wildfires, and what are the risks of that? And it's not just the physical risk, it's then the question of what are the social implications? We saw from the Arab Spring that there are seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. And of course, social stability then becomes a fundamental collapse scenario, because if we lose social stability, if basically we have so many climate refugees, stressed people, then basically does the whole capacity of the planet to respond to climate change, the food insecurity, does that all become very precarious? So really the issue is we may have 10 years to actually address this issue before these dangerous hydrological climate extremes intensify. And of course, we have to then ask the critical question, what is it that we can do? You know, how could we possibly address this? How do we build the avoidance, the resilience, the buffering, but particularly the cooling? that we need to get this climate back under safe natural controls. And so really that's the perspective, the challenge, the imperative that I think we need to look at when we say we're deepening our understanding of climate change, right? Because I think we're seeing, we need to see that hydrology as actually the critical threat. But the good news is, and let's talk about the good news now because we really want us to be very positive. The good news is if it is hydrology, then in a sense, we have a potential to safely and naturally restore our climate rapidly, very, very effectively, profitably, practically, because in a sense, we have agency over land, we have agency over water, and we can, through regenerating that land, that water system, actually come back and safely and naturally build resilience and natural safe cooling. So it's both a danger, but basically because of the danger, but also the urgency of it, it is also, in a sense, a point of influence. We have agency over land, we have agency over water, so can we use that? to regenerate, stabilize, and cool the climate. And that's in a sense very positive because if we were just focused on CO2, then in a sense, it's way past us having any chance to influence it. 
even if we stopped all emissions of CO2, would take a century to a millennia before it would actually alter the climate. There's vast quantities of carbon dissolved in the Earth's oceans, which would then re simply re-equilibrate back into the air as we draw carbon out of the air. And so we're not going to be able to actually change the climate rapidly just through CO2, even if it was the main effect. But if it's hydrology, then actually not only is it more dangerous, but also we do have the prospect of managing it. So that becomes a real challenge now. Okay, what is the basis what do we know about the hydrology of the climate and how can we actually cool the climate safely and naturally through that management of hydrology? And again, we can be very pleased and very good, um, happy because if we look at what nature did to create the climate, to create the biosystems we evolved in and totally depend on, then we can ask the question if we regenerate and copy that regeneration of biosystems that nature did 420 million years ago, can we also restabilize the climate and cool the climate naturally? And of course, the answer is we can. And, and see, this is a very powerful message. Simply by regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge we should be able to as nature did for 20 million years ago and many many times since actually rebuild healthy soils rebuild healthy biosystems rebuild healthy hydrological processes in those biosystems and of course through those hydrologies safely and naturally cool the climate and so it's not the fact that CO2 is the bad guy. CO2 is in fact the resource that we need to take from the air back into our soils to reverse the oxidation of that CO2 that we've been doing through our destructive oxidative agriculture. And if we can reverse that and basically biosequester the carbon back into the soil, to rebuild the sponge, to rebuild hydrology, then yes, we can. We can safely and naturally cool the climate within literally decades rather than the millennia that would would take if we just depended on CO2. It also means this. And just as nature did, it's, it's really quite simple and elegant and totally proven scientifically and practically because all we have to do is as nature, take CO2, water, and sunshine from, in a sense, above, and use that in plants through plant photosynthesis to turn it into sugars and biomass. And then all we have to do is to make sure that a significant portion of that biomass, that plant biomass, is converted into stable soil carbon through microbial biosequestration fixation processes rather than oxidized back into CO2 through burning or excessive respiration. And so just as nature did to create the biosystem and has done repeatedly since, you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanism, we too can accelerate regeneration of the Earth's soil carbon sponge and in that way, restore hydrology and, of course, safely, naturally cool the planet. OK, and so th this becomes then the really powerful opportunity we have, because if we can restore that sponge, if we can restore and put carbon back into the soil to rebuild the sponge, then we can vastly enhance the hydrology of those soils that vastly enhances their capacity to sustain plant growth, the longevity of plant growth, which is then fixing ever more carbon, but also, of course, that provides the essentials for humanity in terms of its food production, its biomaterials, and its biosystem regeneration. 
but that sponge, because it can infiltrate, retain, and make available water for longer, is also profoundly important in naturally safely cooling the climate. Okay, and so that basically becomes a very powerful strategy that we have agency over through our land management. And so the question we're asking here, of course, can agroecology or land, wise land management contribute to climate mediation and cooling? And the answer, of course, yes, we can. And so now our focus is, okay, what is it that we need to do that we can actually provide this cooling? And of course, it's very, again, simple and natural. If we look at nature and ask the question, how does nature cool the planet? What governs and processes that drive 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet and its cooling? It's a very simple matter of, can we understand those processes? And of course, can we regenerate, restore them to similarly create that cooling? And of course, it's very, very, again, simple and available everywhere, right across to the planet, to everybody. We already know, don't we, that if we basically have a forested, vegetated, green landscape that is transpiring, that is taking water from the soils up through their plants and out to the air, it's actually directly air conditioning that local climate. Because to transpire that tree that plant needs to turn water from a liquid into a gas and to do that it needs some 590 calories of heat energy to make that phase change to turn that liquid into a gas and that energy of course comes from that surface environment and then is taken into the upper atmosphere and most of it directly out to space and so simple act of transpiration on this planet can at the moment is still basically cooling the planet or is actually returning some 24 percent of the incident solar radiation from the sun back out to space thereby cooling the planet but we're only at the moment working with perhaps 50 percent of the green land cover that we had naturally you know, our degradation of land systems has basically turned over 5 billion hectares of the 14 billion hectares of land on this planet into desert and wasteland. And so basically we've compromised this significant natural cooling process. And so by increasing the area, but particularly the longevity of green growth on this planet, we can vastly increase this transpirational air conditioning heat transfer, thereby cooling the planet. Another hydrological process which operates in nature, and again, we can harness as well, is to reduce the amount of dust particulates going into the atmosphere. These dust particulates actually are very important, but critical and damaging in actually creating humid hazes, micro droplets of water in the air that are too small to coalesce and too small to fall out. So they stay there as persistent humid hazes. And of course, while they're there as humid hazes, absorbing heat from the sun, mm -hmm. also being a primary factor in the greenhouse effect. And so basically by reducing the amount of land that's bare, exposed, degraded and generating dust, we can significantly reduce these humid hazes. At the moment, some 5 billion tonnes of soil every year is being eroded into the air as dust. We have a brown pollutant cloud all the way from Cairo to Beijing in summer, really heating that area some extra, you know, extra 10% because it's not allowing basically heat to escape through those humid hazes. And so again, our reduction of these humid hazes through 
land management, preventing this dust erosion can have a profound effect. But we can also actually do that in another way. We can remove humid hazes from the atmosphere by coalescing them into cloud droplets. Okay, hygroscopically, basically coalescing these haze micro droplets into larger cloud droplets. And these larger cloud droplets then form clouds which have high albedo effectiveness and actually reflect incident solar radiation straight back out to space. And again, by increasing the cloudiness, these cloud formation, converting humid hazes into cloud, again, we can significantly cool regions and the planet. And of course, we can do that by actually the generation of what we call hygroscopic precipitation nuclei. These are basically, um, there's three types, there's ice crystals, there's salts, and then there's certain bacteria. And in tropical regions, it's actually the bacteria, microbes generated from the canopy of forests that are actually critical in forming these clouds and coalescing these hazes into high albedo cooling clouds. So really, here's another point of agency. If we can reforest, if we can reestablish these hygroscopic precipitation nuclei, natural production through these forests, we can again fundamentally change the hydrology and the cooling through that albedo effect. Those same hygroscopic precipitation nuclei are then fundamentally important in coalescing cloud droplets further to make rain droplets. Hang on, yeah, there's a background now. But so over 50% of the Earth's rain is actually driven by these hygroscopic precipitation nuclei, microbial nuclei generating rainfall. And of course, that's fundamental because that rainfall then removes the water from the sky, returns it to the soils, because that water is essential in that water cycle to actually redrive or continue the transpiration cooling effect we talked about earlier. So these precipitation nuclei in generating rain are fundamental, not just in cooling, of course, but in securing the rainfall that now is absolutely essential in many aridifying areas for human survival. So restabilizing, restabilizing our rainfall naturally, biologically, through these processes. When we do that, we actually create another thing because we reopen nighttime radiation windows. You see, because when that water that is in the hazes is removed from the sky, then heat can re-radiate at nighttime, particularly from the earth directly back out to space, thereby cooling the planet. About 60% of the heat that we've retained in the abnormal greenhouse effect on the planet has in fact been associated with increased nighttime temperatures, which indicates it's actually the extra retention of moisture, I mean, of heat in the atmosphere because of the moisture in the atmosphere. And by removing that moisture as rain through these nuclei, we can actually, again, significantly contrib contribute to cooling the planet. So these are processes in nature that actually drive a big part of that 95% of the Earth's heat dynamic. And these are processes that we can reestablish. And as we've explained, through good agroecology, through good land management practices, which in a sense give us agency to have these effects. There's one other thing that's even more powerful and faster in cooling the planet. And that's simply the question of 365 days perennial plant cover over soils. Because if we can keep plants protecting soils, we can prevent those soils from heating up through incident solar radiation. You know, I, I basically, a 
protected, uh, a soil protected by plants rarely gets above 20 degrees centigrade surface temperature. By contrast, an open, bare, exposed soil, particularly in arid, particularly in tropical areas, can get up to 70 degrees centigrade surface temperatures. And of course, that difference in temperature has a profound effect in how much that soil will re-radiate, how much heat it will re-radiate back into the sky. That's driven by Stefan Bolson physics, which says that the amount of re-radiation is the fourth power of the temperature of that surface in degrees Kelvin. So vast, vast increases in heat re-radiation from bare, hot soils. And what's actually just as important is, and of course we don't think about it this way, but actually the greenhouse effect is driven by the amount of heat that's re-radiating from the Earth's surface, and then the percentage of that heat absorbed by greenhouse gases. But by keeping soil temperatures cooler, by keeping them vegetated and protected and moist, we can effectively turn down the greenhouse effect within weeks because obviously those soils aren't re-radiating heat and which that heat is of course the driver of the greenhouse effect. So we can do that rapidly simply by keeping plants vegetated, moist, protected and cooler. We can do that irrespective of how many greenhouse gases in the air, because of course these greenhouse gases can't absorb heat that hasn't been re-radiated in the first place. So again, here we have a point of enormous agency to rapidly, safely cool regions in the planet by turning down the greenhouse effect simply by keeping soils protected, moist, Shaded and cool. <laughs> okay. There's, okay. Okay. So the basically the answer is yes. We have these points of agency, and now the question really comes: All right, um, how do we actually implement them practically? You know, what is it that we have to do to actually drive that increased building of the soil carbon sponge? And this is really then where the practical agroecology practices come to the fore. And it's actually, again, very simple, as in nature. The key thing that we must do is to maximize plant growth. And just as agriculture is always looking to maximize yields, that's excellent. We just keep on maximizing plant growth because that's drawing down CO2 from the air. And that's of course, creating biomass, which is in a sense, the basis the food substrate for us, but all of life on the planet. But what's then important, and this is something we don't consider at the moment at all. See, what's important is not just the amount of carbon we fix or the biomass that we sequester or produce or fix through photosynthesis, but what matters is what happens to every gram of biomass that is so fixed. You know, what happens to the carbon, the plant material that we are growing? And all through history, there's only two things that can happen to it. It can either burn or oxidize back to, to CO2 rapidly, which in a sense then is negated and it's basically back as CO2 or it could be converted by fungi into stable soil carbon. And it's that ratio of whether it burns or whether it turns into soil carbon, which is where we again have agency. We control that because we control that through our land management. Because if we basically look at management practices that, that minimize oxidation, we can make sure that most of that carbon is available for natural soil fungi to turn into humates and glomalin, which make the soil carbon, the stable soil carbon, 
which of course build the soil carbon sponge. Okay, so it's really a matter of how do we optimize that conversion of the plant biomass that we produce through photosynthesis, through above ground crop growth, how do we maximize that into stable soil carbon? And of course, the good agroecology practices are functioning all through doing just that, by putting more of that carbon into the soil, carbon from the roots, from the root exudates, from the litter, and putting that carbon back into the soil and converting it into stable soil carbon that is then in the soil for 100 to 1,000 years, and avoiding and limiting how much of it is actually burnt. Industrial agriculture, of course, does the opposite. Industrial agriculture is all focused on oxidization. So when we basically clear, burn, cultivate, over-fertilize, use biocides, over-irrigate, but particularly have bare fallows, then all of those processes in industrial agriculture accelerating the oxidation of carbon from our soils. And so effectively taking 100 or often even 120% of the carbon we fix through plant growth back into the air as CO2. In that way, degrading our soils, turning in a sense what were healthy, organic, fertile soils back into degraded landscapes and deserts. Conversely, if we've got agroecology practices that are looking at optimizing the fungal bioconversion into stable soil carbon, minimizing that oxidation, then we can get 60, 70% of the carbon that was fixed by plants actually being used to build soil carbon sponges. And of course, by building soil carbon sponges, rebuilding the hydrology of those soils the productivity of the soils, the resilience of that soil, their biodiversity, and of course their capacity to sustain humanity in perpetuity. Okay, so this is critical because we have agency both in how much we grow, how much plant material is grown, but particularly we have agency on how much oxidative practices are going on and how much stable soil carbon is being fixed. And in a sense, good agroecology is all about optimizing the latter, that last, that carbon fixation process, minimizing, minimizing the oxidation process. So yeah, minimizing burning, minimizing clearing, maintaining 365 day green plant cover, optimizing, uh, well, minimal tillage, optimizing nutrient cycling as making nutrients available microbially rather than through just fertilizers. And of course, then avoiding biocides and particularly avoiding bare fallow, keeping soils protected, regenerated 365 days of the year so they don't heat up, so they don't contribute to that greenhouse effect. So the agroecology practices are basically, that's how they function. And of course, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, where you're doing it, but as long as you're looking at those processes of minimizing oxidation, maximizing soil carbon sequestration, various processes tailored in different regions can be highly effective. And that's in a sense where we are in a sense with agroecology now, isn't it? Because it's all about, can we actually basically look at systems where we basically integrate trees, agroforestries into those systems, thereby basically fixing more carbon, providing more shelter, providing better moisture retention, and all of those things adding to basically increased microbial conversion of biomass into stable soil carbon. Similarly, can we basically integrate ecological grazing systems into those agroforests where we have animals that are taking surface litter, converting them into biofertilizer, stable soil carbon, 
but particularly avoiding them burning, turning straight back to CO2. It's the same thing with natural farming, natural cropping systems. Can we actually have natural cropping, mixed intercropping systems where we keep soils mulched? We basically have plants interplanted without excessive tillage. And we basically are saying, yes, we're just minimizing the disturbance of that soil, maximizing its soil carbon sequestration and soil carbon and soil sponge improvement. Uh, I'm working a lot with uh, Vijay Kumar in India and Andhra Pradesh and Vijay and his farmers have innovated a very, very sophisticated process that we call pre-monsoon dry seeding. And that's enabling us to basically recolonize and regreen and revegetate and rehydrate former arid wastelands by putting basically pelleted seeds, microbes, some organic matter, some slow release mineral nutrient into those systems and getting 365 day plant covers being regenerated. And that's really critical because that's helping to potentially turn some of that 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland back into productive land but also, of course, protecting that land from heating and therefore significantly contributing to turning down the greenhouse effect. Other areas where this agroforestry or agroecology approach is very critical, and that's basically in urban agriculture and village agricultural systems, where again, we're basically saying how much food can we grow within our urban communities in these natural ecological cyclic systems, how much organic waste from those urban communities, how much nutrient, how much water from those urban communities can we safely recycle through this urban agriculture, meeting our food needs, but also contributing significantly to lower pressure on agricultural or oxidative industrial agricultural systems. So overall, the, the message is, yes, we can. We can actually simply by regrowing healthy plants, but then maximizing the conversion of that biomass into stable soil carbon, rebuilding the soil carbon sponge, rebuilding hydrology. Through that process, we can actually not just secure our future water needs, we can secure our future food needs, restore biosystems, their productivity, resilience, it enables us to cool climates safely and naturally, and of course, maintain then social development, social stability, and avoiding social chaos. So really, this is a very, very powerful, simple, natural practice, just as nature did, to actually create healthy biosystems and restore the biosystems we depend on fundamentally for our future. So look in closing, the message is, yes, we can. Um, basically, these agroecology practices, as in nature, give us the potential to not just secure our future, but also secure a safe climate through these hydrological processes. The only issue and the only threat that I see there is actually, can we make the changes that need to be made in time? We may have perhaps less than 10 years before these dangerous hydrological climate extremes intensify and actually limit our capacity for this regenerative renaissance. And the question is then, how do we actually get grassroots action happening everywhere urgently and power farmers, villages, children, urban agriculture, everywhere to actually rebuild the earth soil carbon sponge, hydrology and cooling. There are solutions, but I don't think we can just wait for governments to do this for us because we've been waiting for 50 years 
we don't have 50 years more to do, but we can through agroecology, through grassroots, community, extension, education, and cross mutual support, just simply do it. So basically in concluding, yes, we have solutions. If we don't do these rapidly, things are getting very serious. But the point is the future is in our hands. We're standing on it. It's our soils and restoring its health, the sponge. So the bottom line is let's just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thumbs up, up if we are all agreeing that yes, we can. That's the message. Are we all agreeing? Thumbs up? Yes. <laughs> I would want to see that. Thumbs up. Yeah, we are all agreeing that yes, we can. And uh, that was a really, really powerful presentation, Professor. Thank you so, so much. Um, without uh, taking much of your time, I know we have participants here who would want to ask questions, but uh, we, already have, we already have two on the chat. We'll get back to that. Kindly, uh, if you'd like to uh, ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand. I can see already Peter, Peter Goodall's already your hand is up. Then uh, probably professor, you can take uh, two or three questions, respond, then you can take another round. Is that okay? Yes, look, I've got time. So look, please, but I'll, I'll do them through you. So you basically, I mean, because I can't see the chat. So you just yes. basically ask the question and I can answer. Thank you so Hopefully. much. So yeah, thank you. Let's start with Peter. I'll go back to the chats later. Thank you. Welcome, Peter. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Henney. Um, I don't disagree with anything you've said and I, I find it very inspiring and motivational, but there is one issue that I would like you to maybe expound on a bit more. Um, you have been using very sweeping global terms, cool, cooling the planet, um, <laughs> yep. um, good soil for humanity in perpetuity. The work that right. I do, and I think that most of us do, is I'm with a farmer, I'm with a community. They're not worried about the whole planet. They're not worried about mitigation, frankly. They're worried about how are they going to get their crops, you know, yep. enough to feed their family tomorrow. And all, most of what you've said, I mean, yes, but how do we communicate the essence of this in a way that will make sense to them? Because without their involvement without their sense of ownership without their understanding it won't happen so i'm just wondering I, if you could sort of bring your focus down to where we yeah, mostly work at the absolutely. community level and what do we say there because what you've okay. given us is is a global plan you know yeah uh, okay. so that's my um, question no no thank you a very important question of course and we try to get down to because we raise this with the urban agriculture every square meter, every square meter of green that you can produce, sustain, every plant that you can grow, you look at every plant, it fixes carbon. Now the question is what happens to that plant? Does it basically oxidize or does it go into stable soil carbon through compost or directly in the soil? So yes, this is operating and this is the empowerment of the grassroots aspect of the story. Obviously, I let, let's elaborate that. Yes, it's basically every square meter, every person, every farmer, every villager, every child growing plants. And these processes work at that micro level. But of course, then scaled up, they actually also work at the planetary level. But the empowerment is, yes, every farmer, every square meter, every hectare. You know, yes, we, this is all adding to it. As far as the global picture, it's really, again, very simple and quite, quite doable, right? We've got obviously incident solar radiation from the sun, some 342 watts per square meter at the top of the troposphere. And to have a stable climate, we've got to have 342 watts going back out. The greenhouse effect is retaining at the moment some three watts per square meter extra heat. So we are heating this planet about 1% or a bit less than 1% of incident solar radiation. So our collective efforts at regenerating more green, at increasing transpiration, at increasing the sponge, at 
protecting soils, all of these things added up can readily basically turn that 1% extra heat back out into space. Okay, so it's all very, it's only 1%, it's very doable, but it comes through the collective actions of everybody on every square meter. So you're right, people are looking at their food at their own little patch, but really the credit is that in doing that, and if enough of us do that, that is the collective effect. So it's empowering action at every farmer, everywhere, at every scale, and just do it. And really they're all contributing globally to their future. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I, I hope that is sufficient, Peter, but we're still discussing. I'll go to Musa. Musa, kindly unmute and ask your question or concern. Okay. Um, thank you, Karin, and thank you, uh, Professor, for the wonderful and highly enriching presentation. Uh, just two uh, questions or comments. Uh, first, um, from a pastoralist uh, community, which means we are we are keeping animals. Yes, we are. We are aware of our contribution might be to the climate change, but we are also aware of our contribution might be if better used to mitigate or adopt climate change in the area of, for example, uh, we have been, Boscoda have been carrying a project on what we call alliance farming. That's using a piece of land that we use for the cattle to, to use this piece of land by dropping cattle dump and cattle urine, which is restoring the, the, the soil fertility. And after some time, the cattle will move and then the farmer will farm on that cattle, yes. on that land using already an enriched soil and have a better yield. But yes. unfortunately, this practice has not been scaled up due to uh, might be inadequate funding, as I can say. And, okay. But how is this useful? For example, this practice, how is it look, useful look. in this yeah, no, uh, yeah, in very this process important. of soil restoration. And the second question, if I land on that, is yes, uh, we all say yes to agroecology practice, but we know that the big funding organization or multilateral are not yet on agroecology as an option. So how can we respond to practice okay. agroecology in a large scale that will turn the table before this 10 years or less than 10 years that we might be in total chaos? Thank you. Okay, you look, thank you very much. Uh, big topics and lots, we could talk for a long time, but let's get to the guts of it. Look, first of all, the issue of cattle or herbivores, right? Not doesn't have to be cattle, herbivores. There are 14, hectare, 14 billion hectares of land on this planet. 8 billion hectares were forest. About 6 billion hectares were rangelands, grasslands. The grasslands are there because they are seasonally dry or seasonally cold. So they weren't sustaining trees because of that climatic variation. And because of that climate variation, you weren't, I mean, nature wasn't able to evolve litter breakdown systems because in the dry period, it would just be too dry. And then fires would take over, taking that landscape back to desert. And so in a sense, what nature did, she evolved herbivores because the herbivores are effectively mobile, bioreactors, they're mobile compost heaps, right? 
So you look at these herbivores and their guts are acting as basically compost heaps, taking all that biomass, converting all that biomass, often very low grade biomass into protein, which of course we use as food, but also biofertilizer dung, and of course stable soil carbon also in the dung. They also produce some methane, but that's another story, but it's no problem. But the point is that we've got to look at these herbivores as actually recycling agents. They are critically important in these rangelands. And as you're saying, you can then manage those grazing ecologies, concentrate that, concentrate the biofertilizers from them, and then you can integrate farming systems. Conversely, we can grow agroforests where we're growing forests and crops, and we can use the herbivores as against recycling agents. So yes, the integration of grazing ecologies into this agroecosystem approach is very, very important. And these animals are unique, particularly on our grasslands, because if we don't eat them, they will burn. If they, you know, if the, the grasses aren't eaten, they will burn. And the grasslands again turn back to desert. As far as the question about funding and lack of funding of agroecology, yes, that's right. And in a sense, what I'm hoping, like my talk and my work can do, is basically not focus on agroecology. You've got to fund that but basically say to all these people, you've got to fund your own survival. You've got to fund your own future. And if your future is about regeneration, rehydration, cooling, water security, food security, you fund that. And if agroecology is a vehicle, is a tool to help build those sponges, that water, that cooling, that ecology, then yes, of course, you fund agroecology. But so rather than selling agroecology per se, sell their own self-interest at survival. And the good news is that's happening, right? We're now basically getting very, very major, significant corporate interests saying, hey, we need to regenerate. We need to build resilience. We need to rehydrate. We need to cool. And they don't care what the method or the vehicle is, they need those outcomes. And if we say, yes, we can, and yes, we're using agroecology as a tool, they don't blink from funding it. So that's the potential, but perhaps it's just rephrasing the argument to these, you know, the big finance interests to say, look, this is your future that we're investing in rather than you invest in agroecology per se, because yes, you're right, they don't understand. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Professor, for that response. Uh, we have some questions on the chat. Oh, Doug, are you with us? Would you like to speak up and raise your question or you want us to read? Sure, no, I, I, can, I can say something. Um, thank you. I would be interested, um, uh, Walter, thanks for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that um, I think c carbon dioxide from fossil fuels is only 4% of the problem, if I heard you correctly. Um, but it appears to me that so much of our response is, is going into renewable energy. Would it, I mean, is the implication that we should perhaps be redirecting some of those resources into reforestation right, okay. and agroecology? Yeah, look, Derek, thank you very much. Now, basically, it's not either or, it's both, right? Now, obviously, yes, we have to reduce emissions. And obviously, yes, we have to reduce our use of fossil fuels because, yeah, that's contributing to the issue. The point is, as far as the 4%, basically, the CO2 greenhouse effect is driving 4% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet, right? So it's not even just the fossil fuel, that's the total CO2 greenhouse effect. And the answer is no, we can't actually cool the planet in time or significantly at all, just by reducing CO2. It's far too impotent. It, it just isn't effective enough. It would take million, I mean, sorry, 
thousands of years to be effective. And it's really therefore hydrology that gives us the only point of agency that can actually cool the planet as nature did. As far as the effect of fossil fuels, again, Charles Keeling showed this really wonderfully. You saw his graph, look in winter, CO2 levels increase, particularly in the Northern hemisphere. In summer, spring, they go down again. So every year globally, there is a flux, a dynamic of some 250 billion tons of carbon that goes both as emissions and then drawdown every year globally. And basically our fossil fuel emissions in total are about 10 billion tons of carbon. So that's 10 out of 250. Again, some 4% of our emissions, or 4% of that carbon flux dynamic is governed by our fossil fuel use. There is, I mean, the, the amount of emissions from wildfires, forest wildfires, exceeds that from fossil fuel use. We've just never recorded it and re registered because we've said that's nature's problem, that's not man made. Well, sorry, it is because. We, the people who govern fuel loads, we're the people who govern wildfires. And so we're saying is we have agency, if we look at that whole 250 billion tons of carbon flux every year, we have a potential easily, profitably, to take 20 billion tons of carbon out of that flux through reduced emissions and increased biosequestration, increased carbon drawdown fixation. So again, it's, I mean, we, we always look, we've always looked at fossil fuels as a bad guy. Well, sorry, they're only 4% of the whole flux. The problem is so serious, we've got to go way beyond that. We've got to go much faster than just fossil fuels. We can do that through land regeneration, rehydration. We can do 20 billion tons carbon drawdown per year by 2030 to get to negative net emissions by 2030. But here's the punchline. It only is relevant. It only works if we put that carbon into the sponge to rebuild the hydrology, to rebuild the water security, the food security, and the natural safe cooling. Because if we just do counting as is happening now with the IPC, it's often very, very dodgy sort of data and basically accounting in itself isn't going to save the climate. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as, as we wait for any other hand in case there is, there's a question from Rose. Rose, are you with us? Just trying to get it also. Rose is not, uh, any other person who would like to raise a concern or speak? Ask a question. Yeah, we have good comments. There's one from John Wilson. The good thing is that uh, building the soil carbon sponge is the best thing farmers can do to help themselves produce enough nutritious food. But the big question is for farmers to find the how in all their different contexts. Yes? For, for farmers to say, for how to be build the sponge. Was that the question? Yeah, no, it's not a question. It was just a comment, Walter. It's comment. Just, uh, oh, I, really, yeah. in, in response to Peter's, uh, Peter's, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, look, I agree. And in a sense, that's why the focus uh, that we call it ABC, a, maximizing agriculture, maximizing yield, which of course farmers do and need to do to feed themselves, but then focusing on B, minimizing burning, minimizing oxidation, and maximizing instead C, which is converting that biomass into stable soil carbon through increased microbial activity, fungal activity in the soil to store that as humates and glomalin. And yes, so that ABC applies everywhere on every square meter, every continent, every hectare. And uh, yeah, that's the point of practice. 
And the point is that there's just, yeah, minimizing oxidation through, you know, those industrial oxidative practices and maximizing that natural microbial conversion into humus and glomalin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rose, uh, Vanessa, sorry, not Vanessa. Vanessa Black from Biowatch. Hi, Hi morning, and thank you for that um, thought-provoking presentation, Prof. I just wanted to ask um, a question around how you argue or prevent um, this hypothesis being taken up by industrial interests and um, sort of being used to, as false solutions. And or the reason I'm asking that is just it seems like there's all these pro proliferations of schemes to say, oh, we can, um, you know, make up for your air travel or whatever by reforestation. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of planting yeah. trees, alien trees in areas yeah. that should be grasslands and, and yeah. not taking into account any social issues or any of the natural, very diverse um, yeah. ecosystems. <laughs> so just your response yeah. on how you come to that. No, look, uh, thank you very much. And uh, look, very important. Look, we, we had 30 years from Kyoto. And finally, in Paris 2015, we thought we had a, a credible agreement and a credible target to basically zero carbon emissions. And we accepted the concept of offsets and carbon accounting. But for the next six years, all we've done or all the IPCC did is really sort of basically watered down standards to the point that there are no standards now. Every nation just simply uh, assumes and quotes or claims whatever they wish as far as their mission, and there's no scrutiny whatever. And so we're in a world now of carbon accounting where there's a lot of fallacious, meaningless uh, carbon offsets, carbon accounting, carbon trading going on. But as we're saying, unless that carbon is actually used to rebuild the sponge in a practical, real sense, it's meaningless, right? So just having carbon accounts per se and offsets and it's all greenwash, unless you're building the sponge to rebuild hydrology, to rebuild these hydrological dynamics, yeah, you're just deluding yourself, right? More deception, more, yeah, more just uh, fraud. And so that's the trouble. We're now in a world where politicians are saying, oh, yes, I've got this uh, hypothetical aspirational target. I'm doing my own accounting, claiming that I'm reaching my target in this and this way. But in reality, well, I can't say none of it works, but in reality, most of it is all a fiction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, kindly allow me to read Rose's uh, Rose question because she has uh, requested me to do so. Can the issue of energy crisis be resolved by production of agrofuels? Will we not see an increase in global warming due to deforestation and biodiversity destruction through industrial agrofuel production? How best can the problem of energy crisis be addressed amid these efforts to cool down the earth? To you, Prof. Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Again, it's a very big field, complex, many factors. The first thing is, you know, like, yes, can we actually address our energy needs? And of course, yes, we can by energy efficiency as a first step, right? So do we use less? Do we need all the energy and cultivation and fertilizer and biocides, all the embodied energy? Because if we're going back to these nat more natural systems, the, the bottom line is, no, we need to have far, far lower inputs. We can operate on 10%, 20% of the inputs, and that's enormously effective in saving. Secondly, can we actually, yeah, produce energy from biofuels, et cetera? And if the answer is yes, we can, and there's nothing wrong with it. But again, it's a balance, isn't it? Because if you are harvesting biomass for fuel, then you must make sure that you are naturally safely regenerating, regenerating more than that amount through your reforestation, your ecological reforestation strategies, right? So the answer is there's nothing wrong with actually using biofuels ecologically as long as, as a net effect, you are actually restoring more land, 
growing more forest to replace what you've burned. So you've got a positive net effect. So basically, I think we've just, again, got caught and the industrial world is caught, is defining the energy, I mean, the carbon accounting, the whole um, climate story in terms of its energy, when in fact, it's not energy, it's water. It's really building resilient biosystems, it's natural cooling. And of course, there, the energy debate is just missing in action completely. In fact, in fact, we are now using more energy in the Western world for air conditioning and keeping, trying to keep away from heat stresses in summer than we are from heating ourselves in winter. And so if anything, again, it's the natural safe cooling that minimizes the need for air conditioning, which is probably the biggest um, uh, energy dividend we can deliver in terms of consumption. So look, um, I don't know if that answers the question, but look, there's a whole lot of angles of energy. Of course, we need energy as part of our industrial ecology, and we'll continue to do so, but there are very efficient, simple ways of doing it. There's also lots of energy. I mean, the actual, the point of growing energy fuel, oil-based energy fuel instead of fossil oils is again, totally viable. We have to look at each, a project, each proposal critically in terms of their total life cycle costs and impacts. But if we do that, many of them stack up very positively. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, on the chat, there are some resources that have been shared, links to some resources. Kindly make some time and look at them. But we have a question from Charles. Uh, how can we help farmers to access the extra labor needs for agroecological farm practices? And how do we easily demonstrate the economic viability of agroecological farming enterprises for farmers or to farmers? Question to you again. Uh, okay, so, uh, yes, again, a very good question and very important. See, at the moment, we again, it's fraudulent because we use metrics, you know, the measures, the performance measures we basically just look measures that basically the industrial agriculture wants to say, look, here are yields, tons per hectare. And they, they come out with that. And rather than looking critically at all the costs, all the consequences, all the actual valid metrics. So a lot of the conventional agriculture is, of course, heavily subsidized and protected, you know, through subsidy or yeah, farm bills, subsidies, et cetera. And again, we're not getting the valid data. I think when we look at the valid data and we use the proper metrics, the proper performance measures, and we look at both things like yield, also nutritional integrity, the natural capital value in terms of soil improvement, the social capital value of food equity, food access, then we come up with completely different economic analyses. And so I think the measure is, okay, we've got to define metrics, performance measures, values and outcomes on our own terms, rather than saying, oh, we've got to compete with industrial farming on their terms, because obviously they've externalized most of their real costs they're effectively mining, extractively mining our soils, degrading them. And of course, they're not counting for any of that. They're not counting for any of the pollution consequences. And all of that is actually giving completely false accounting when you say, look, okay, then they're not achieving the same returns on investment compared to conventional. The bottom line is, is will the cropping systems be able to sustain? Will they survive or are they actually cannibalizing, degrading the soil capital, the social capital, and basically leading to collapse? And of course, that's really the end point. But yes, in the meantime, they're using fallacious metrics to argue and defend their position. Mm. Yeah, there's, a, there's another question here, Professor, uh, from Mujere. Very interesting. 
any significant uh, difference among agroecology, organic agriculture, and climate smart agriculture? According to you, Professor, I think this has been an issue in, in several countries that we are working in, and uh, particularly also when you're engaging uh, policymakers, they raise so many questions. They do not understand the, the differences between or how they interconnect, uh, in case they interconnect, how they do that, and how best they can support the process. So just adding a bit of yeah. more information on that. Thank yeah, you. well, look, uh, very, very much the case. Now, obviously, yes, we have a very wide range of terms and practices and methods you know whether it's organic farming permaculture agroecology natural farming biodynamic so there's a vast vast range and basically the bottom line is yes their labels their brands and what we're trying to promote and really the critical thing is as nature does what are the simple natural processes that actually create healthy biosystems. And that's, of course, as we've been trying to say, building the sponge, rebuilding the hydrology, minimizing oxidation, maximizing natural microbial nutrient cycling, biofertility. So rather than going on labels, you know, like what are the actual labels of different cultures, you know, permaculture, etc. let's just focus on the processes. Here are the natural processes of growth, of cycling, of water availability, if we're maximizing and optimizing those, then I'm happy whatever the language you want to use. So, and the bottom line is, yeah, let's not have disputes between you know, different branches of effectively the same thing, whether we call it natural farming, agroecology or what. <laughs> Can we, there's, there's a lot of background noise. Please and please mute if you're not speaking kindly. Uh, there's a final question on the chat. Maybe Simon, you can help me mute those that are not speaking kindly. We are almost done with this webinar. Just a few, one more question. Then if there's any other last comment, that would be great. There's a question from, uh, from Wilberforce. And uh, interesting, I think a follow-up of what you've just talked about, Professor. How can we get our policymakers to understand this simple message of agroecology facilitating the, the building up of soil carbon? Right. Uh, so the question is, how do you get your policymakers to understand? Well, the best thing is just to do it, just to do it at individual farmer, at village, at collective levels, and just demonstrate just how powerful it is. And let's use the example of Andhra Pradesh in India, Vijay Kumar. He's got one million very poor, originally very poor women farmers, and they just adopted the natural farming processes. And of course, they were just so outstanding, you know, higher yields, higher nutritional, higher nutritional food, much better, you know, social um, benefits with 10%, 20% of the imports. And then the outcomes that these 1 million women farmers were achieving in Andhra Pradesh speak for themselves to the extent that that went right through India and now the whole Modi government right throughout India has basically adopted natural farming from the demonstrated, verified examples from Andhra Pradesh. So it's just a matter of just doing it. And your policy leaders, your political leaders, they will just see that, look, this is a winning solution. This meets all the social, ecological, financial objectives of my, of my country and they will be appropriating and putting their face against you, uh, welcoming you very, very quickly. So it's not a matter of convincing the policy makers, it's just doing it and they will come like blowflies. Thank you, thank you, Professor. We've got some concerns, people are requesting for presentations, but apart from that, well, from what Professor has just uh, presented, I said earlier, we have some, uh, some links to some resources that have been shared on the chat, but it would be good, Professor, that you share the presentation and any yes. other related 
information to us through AFSA so that we can yeah. share with the team. Yeah. Look, I will yeah. I will send you a copy of the presentation, right? No, no question. And then um, there are lots of links now being developed. Uh, there, I mean, obviously on the web and stuff, Regenerate Earth, we've got some of them, but there's a lot of links in agroecology. Uh, other good news is that Vijay Kuma, again, Andhra Pradesh, India, they're setting up actually a university in agroecology. And basically this whole information exchange um, and the whole uh, empowerment catalytic extension of agroecology and these practices will blossom from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That was really powerful and engaging. Thank you very much, Professor. I cannot see any other hand. Unless I missed out on a question, kindly just remind me. Uh, those uh, Bridget and Simon, is there any that we have not uh, uh, talked about or discussed? I think not for now, but I think we have, uh, we can get a hold of uh, Professor Walter uh, online and personally as actually even check with them, ask questions and ask for any other resources can, that can support our climate change and agroecology working group to continue advocating for these uh, agroecological approaches that we're doing in our different countries. And also powerfully continue working on uh, ensuring that we have a very, very active movement on agroecology in Africa and uh, uh, globally. So, uh, I would want to really thank you very much, Professor. I hope you had a glass of water or coffee. <laughs> yeah, that was really, really, really informing and powerful. Uh, we look forward to more, more of this. All right. Yes. I Someone raising their oh. hand. Ah, OK. Dodos. Yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah, Dodos. Okay, I'll come back to you, Dodos. So just thanking that and uh, telling that to Professor so that uh, we keep yeah. engaging. But before we close, uh, I'll give uh, uh, Dodos or Mr. Kalalas an opportunity to speak. Then uh, we can uh, close the webinar. Thank you. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but uh, I'm not uh, very sure in English. I would like to, uh, to speak in French. Ahead, it's okay. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you. On initie une initiative et qu'on n'a pas beaucoup plus de moyens pour l'élargir, afin que ça puisse produire beaucoup plus, euh, c'est comme si c'est oublié, c'est comme si ça n'a pas beaucoup d'impact. Euh, je donne l'exemple d'un projet, d'un petit projet, d'une étude que nous sommes en train de faire. Euh, au niveau du Nord Kivu, avec euh, nos structures, nous essayons de faire euh, quelque chose comme euh, promotion de l'engrais bio à base du rime humain. On a constaté que, à base du rime humain, on peut produire beaucoup plus, la production peut se multiplier par trois. Malheureusement, euh, il fallait euh, un appui à ce projet parce que c'est une étude que nous avons faite euh, à, euh, à petite échelle, et, mais nous avons constaté que, et les producteurs le confirment, la production se multiplie par trois. Mais malheureusement, cette étude, ce projet devrait avoir des moyens pour que ça puisse... Euh, Euh, avoir beaucoup plus d'impact et être adapté sur euh, euh, une, échelle, une, une échelle un peu plus étendue. Ah, voilà euh, l'intervention que je voudrais donner.
Oui, je peux encore ajouter par rapport, il a souligné un point qui, qui m'a encore euh, rappelé quelque chose, euh, le pâturage agroécologique. Ça, c'est un autre point qui m'a rappelé par rapport au, au projet que nous avons encore et que nous avons essayé de partager à certains partenaires lorsque nous étions dans la conférence euh, euh, internationale AFSA qui, qui s'est tenue à Kampala. Euh, C'est un projet qui est lié, euh, euh, disons, euh, agroécologique au Breed Park of Kibo. C'est le projet un parc d'élevage de, de agroécologique du Kibo. Si on initie ce genre de projet et qu'on récolte tout ce qui est produits comme excréments, comme urine, comme déchets dans ce parc et on l'injecte dans l'agriculture, on va trouver qu'on va petit à petit oublier l'utilisation des engrais chimiques et cela va aussi euh, aider les, les petits agriculteurs à comprendre, à récupérer, à regagner ce qu'ils ont perdu, parce que bien avant, ils utilisaient les engrais, et nos engrais bio. On ne savait pas les engrais chimiques. Mais aujourd'hui, ils ont adopté les engrais chimiques pensant que ça produit beaucoup plus au moment où, euh, localement, on peut fabriquer l'engrais bio à partir de cet élevage, comme nous proposons le parc. Euh, le parc euh, euh, d'élevage agroécologique du Kivu, comme nous proposons euh, cette promotion de l'engrais bio à base du riz humain, ce sont des choses que, qui, qui manquent d'appui au moment où ça peut se développer jusqu'à produire de l'impact à grande échelle. Merci. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oui, ah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Professor, you have any comment on uh, his, the issues he has raised? Look, uh, look, uh, yeah, no, no, look, I'm afraid I haven't got the translation on my um, oh. iPhone here. So, no, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't uh, yeah I, I wasn't able to actually understand oh, yeah. but but perhaps if let's have that com, um, let's have that communication just in writing and then we can come back on that right okay okay thank you uh, probably we can even come back on that uh, through email oh, or yeah. other yeah, communication through, channels if we yeah. don't have time yeah 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 because I, I haven't got that translation on my iPhone oh, yeah. right Oh, okay, okay, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, Senna, our our chairperson of uh, the Climate Change and Agriculture Working Group, is with us, and uh, I would also we not finish this meeting without him at least saying something and closing for us. Unless there's a very burning issue, I don't want to leave anyone out. If not, uh, I will welcome uh, my chair, uh, Senna Loka to close this webinar. But as we have said, this is not the end. We just continue chatting and emailing each other just to communicate in case there are issues we did not get uh, for presentation. We'll also get back to you through the secretariat uh, so that uh, we keep it uh, going, the discussion going. So over to you, uh, my chair, Senna. You're welcome to say something, then close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Buenos dias, professor. Good morning, all, all the teams. I'm so happy to be with you this morning, as you see, with this Jumong uh, Barak. Salam alaikum to my Muslim friends. Uh, say in Togo, community professor, to learn from you, to hear your insights, and see that change is possible, that agroecology is 
uh, unequivocably the best solution ever to this challenge we are facing today. Thank you very much for making your time. Thank you very much for sharing those insights. We promise you that we we'll make a good use of those uh, information we got and that you hear from us very soon as the Agroecology and Climate Change Group of AFSA will be uh, um, dipping deep uh, into uh, the, the point we share and we'll be seeing how we'll see how we can you know make use of those points to improve our uh, strategy. Again, uh, obrigado, thank you very much from wherever you are. And colleagues, bonjour, bonsoir, merci beaucoup. Uh, Asante Sana, thank you very much for attending this amazing conference. We hope we'll be meeting similar um, experts like Professor Walter this morning. And uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Bridget and Tim and Simon for making this possible. Uh, Asante Sana, Mama Karen for chairing this great session. I am a, a, a new a change person this morning. I hope the same for you. Thank you very much. See you very soon. And please join the Agroecology and Climate Change Working Group. A bientôt, au revoir, and Kwaheri. Kwaheri, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kwaheri. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank everyone. Bye. Yes. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Great. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.